Our closing film, Radioactive, is directed by Marjan Satrapi, and it explores such questions. It's based on the remarkable graphic novel by Lauren Redness. Radioactive is more than a simple biopic on the life and career of Marie Curie. It's the story of a brilliant, determined woman fighting to be heard. And you know, Marie Curie was brilliant, she was a genius, and we don't use words like brilliant and genius enough in referring to women, and we need to do that more. We're grateful to Amazon Studios and Studio Canal for providing us with this film. I'm grateful that the electric Rosamund Pike is back in another performance at the festival. She was here just last year, and it's great to see her uh, on the big screen again. And I'm so thrilled that Marjan Satrapi, just a wonderful original voice in filmmaking, is here tonight to present the world premiere of her film to you. Please join me in welcoming Marjan Satrapi. Thank you, Cameron. Uh, I'm very pleased to be here tonight. Uh, very excited, also very stressed, because this is the first time I'm going to watch the film with an audience. So obviously, I did not come alone. I just wanted to present you uh, people that came with us. But first of all, I want uh, us to applaud the fantastic writer of the book, Radioactive, Lauren Redness, that is in the audience tonight with us. Also uh, are with me my dear friend and producer, Paul Webster. <laughs> the awesome, amazing, very talented scriptwriter, Jack Thorne. The fantastic Anurin Bernard with his beautiful curly hair. <laughs> and last but not least, uh, the star of the film, the amazing Rosamund Pike. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm, I'm feeling nervous now because you're all going to see our, our precious child, is what it feels like. And when, I'm, when I met Marjan, um, maybe two years ago or a year and a half ago, two years ago maybe, um, I met this brilliant, idiosyncratic, original, funny, um, bold, daring woman. And I thought, well, if anyone can tell the story of another daring, brilliant, unusual, implacable woman, then it's Marjan. And, um, and I think, you know, Marjan and I became kind of kindred spirits in pursuit of finding the truth of Madame Curie. And uh, I think she was our lodestar, really, all the way through the shooting. Um, I hope that you come to love her as, as much as, as we do, um, but, but really, this film is Marjan's, and, and I think she's done something extraordinary with an extraordinary woman, and it's kind of exploded the confines of, of everything I hoped or dreamt that the film could be, because she's, she's kind of taken it further and beyond, and she's brilliant. I hope you feel the same. Team from Radioactive, producer Paul Webster, screenwriter Jack Thorne, and actors Anurin Barnard, the star of Ro Radioactive, Rosamund Pike, and the director Marjan Satrapi.
thank you so much for the film and for bringing it to Toronto and, and just giving us a chance to hear a little bit more about its making as well. Um, I want to start with you, Marjan, if we could. And, you know, Marie Curie is someone that we know from history. Maybe we don't know enough about her, and I think this film will help. But for you, what was the most important thing about Marie Curie that you wanted to communicate through the film? Well, um, first of all, I want, you know, you say the, in the other cinema, the word brilliant has to be more associated with women. And uh, studies, they showed that small girls, until the age of seven, they can consider themselves as being geniuses. And after the age of seven, genius is something that only go with boys. So that was, first of all, to make science attractive, because I think is nothing more attractive than intelligence. It's the sexiest thing in the world is intelligent people. So that was one thing. And I think uh, as the half of the population in the world are women, so if we just talk about statistic and number, so half of the story should be about women. And this is not the case. Uh, all the women, most of the, most of the film, they're always related to their, the wife of, the lover of, the mother of, the sister of, they're always related to someone. And Marie Curie is herself. Everything else is related to her. So that was this. And then I loved this, un com she's completely uncompromising. She doesn't never compromise. And without making ca a case out of it, she's just like that. So. Uh, I grew up, you know, with the myth of Madame Curie, but one, that is only once I started making the film that I understood how truly huge, immense she was. Thank you. <laughs> Rosamond, for you, Marie Curie is someone about whom much has been written, but uh, in order to portray her on screen, I'm sure you had to find a kind of an essence of this character, a core. And I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about what that was for you. I felt she was a very busy person. Oh, that's interesting. Um, focused on the task in hand at all times. A, lo a lot of clues came from the photographs that exist of her, where never once does she seem to be completely standing still and accepting of having her photograph taken. She always seems slightly annoyed that the process is going on. She's usually in conversation with someone while the photo's being taken on or hurrying to the next destination. It's, it's very hard to find a picture of her not looking slightly impatient if she is standing still or otherwise. Um, there's, a, there's, there's a wonderful picture of the Solvay conference where you know, she's literally the only female with all the eminent, other eminent male scientists of her generation. And they're all you know, posing very nicely for the camera and she's just busily involved in conversation with her neighbor who seems rather put out that he can't put on his best face for the camera. Um, <laughs> so there was clues like, it was clues like that. Um, as well as, I suppose, that plus this document that came out about a year before we made the film, which hitherto has been kept completely private by the Curie family, and that was a, a, a grief journal that she kept in the days and weeks after Pierre's death. And I went to have a meeting with Marjan in Paris and we were having breakfast and Marjan presented me this translation of a page of this journal and it was the most moving outpouring of love, true, sincere, grief-wracked love that I've ever read. And I, I, I've, I w I would just move me to tears into my croissant. And, um, <laughs> and I thought, my God, no, no, nobody knows this side of this woman. You know, everything you see is this formidable, you know, um, brilliant, quite austere, uh, quite odd character. And there inside is this person with rivers of feeling and love. And I thought, how interesting. So now I've got the two sides of this person. I just have to fill in the rest. It is a love story as well as a story of a, a genius, and I wonder for both you and for Anurin, if you could talk a little bit about creating that relationship on screen, what you were drawing on, and, and, and just given that journal that you mentioned, what kind of uh, resources did you have at hand to, to, to get the, the character of the relationship? Yes, uh, for both of you. 
Um, well, Aniron had a sort of, you had a bit of a tricky turn coming in as man number two. <laughs> uh, <laughs> when really, you know, she still only got her heart for man number one. <laughs> How did you feel about that? <laughs> I don't mind being number two for you, Rosman, that's fine. Um, um, well, you know, the position I was in was that I was in love with both her and with uh, Pierre. And they really, you know, for Paul, the character that I play, he, they really set him up for a life in success um, because he was training underneath them. And, he were, and I believe that he had a great privilege and honor to be kind of ghosted through things. And, um, and you know, behind closed doors, uh, Paul had a very disturbing marriage where he was being constantly beaten by his wife. Um, so he had a very complex human being, which, you know, we don't really, I think there's only one thing that shows that in this movie, which is in the last scene with me and Rosmond, we put like a little cut on my lip because it was something that was being um, closely protected within his world. So I think for him, it was a, an escapism. And I think he, he really did love Mary and, and then he loved um, Pierre, but uh, it just came out within this kind of frantic um, affair, which was always doomed to fail because he was always going to be number two. Um, Paul and Jack, I want to ask you about the project uh, of Radioactive, and films sometimes take years to, uh, to complete. This film is coming out at a particular moment when I think audiences are really crying out for more films by and about women, and, and you were two of the people who, who helped to bring this to completion. Can you talk a little bit about the history of the project and how it came to be? Sure. Um, 2012, I read Lauren's uh, book, Radioactive Tale of Love, Love and Fallout, and immediately saw that there was immense cinematic potential, extraordinary life story to depict. Uh, and I didn't have a clue how, how, how to do that. So luckily, I thought about Jack Thorne. I was working with Working Title with Tim Bevan and Amelia at Working Title as well. And uh, we all agreed that Jack would be the best man for the job. And uh, we gave you a very difficult job, I believe, in adaptation. Yeah, but also quite... Uh, uh, um, the, 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 this, this book, Lauren's book, is the most extraordinary book. It's, uh, it's a graphic novel that tells the story of two things, of Marie Curie and radioactivity. And what she does is she fuses the two of them all the way through. Um, and, uh, and that was a real um, privilege to get to play in that world and to try and do the same sort of fusing. And actually, I fused it in completely different ways, the way the film fuses it now, that the, 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 the bits got moved around. But, but it was really, really fun. <laughs> I want to ask maybe you and, and Marjan about uh, what audiences expect from biopics, the story of a great life and often chronological. You did not give us that. You took us well beyond uh, the bounds of uh, Marie Curie's chronology into what, her, what the impact of her work was as well, in, including the, the terrible impact of the atomic bomb. Uh, and I imagine that's drawing on the source material. I haven't read the, the original graphic novel, but I imagine that might be there as well. But in terms of how you shaped the story, the chronology of it, what kinds of, kind of leaps of imagination you allowed yourself. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that. Well, actually, th that this is because that was all this flash forward and all this questioning that I was really, really interested to make the, the, the film. And I always promised to myself that these three things that I will never make, the sequel, a remake, and a biopic. Yeah. These are the three. But th when this, this, this uh, script, I, I read it, for me, it was not just a simple biopic. It, it put really in the center of attention a question that I always have is about the ethic that we have in the society. Uh, any ethic, so scientific ethic, political ethic, whatever. So you have two of the most decent people in the world that they discover two elements. They discover the phenomenon of radioactivity and the result of that is of course curing the cancer, but the result of that is of course also the atom bomb. And 
the, the, the problem is of Madame Curie and the problem is of Pierre Curie. The problem is that what we as human beings, we do with it. And therefore I think it made lots of reasoning for me in the world that we are living today. I mean, if you see, for example, the, the scene of racism against Madame Curie, that is just this hyper-nationalistic feeling just before the First World War, and you feel exactly the same thing is happening today in the world, in Europe, you know, with all these populistic movements, you know, for, the problem is the foreigner, and if we kill them all, we will all live with, between each other and everything would be fantastic and marvelous, so that is one side. The other side, for example, is the uh, artificial intelligence. Obviously, if we use it, you know, to make the best heart surgery possible is a very good thing, but if we use the artificial intelligence to go and recognize, for example, uh, the Rohingyas in Birmania and kill all of them, and feel very, very clean about it because we didn't, we didn't kill them, some kind of robot killed them, then it re it's really bad. So it's really these big questions. And how to find, find the balance of it, it was the most difficult thing in the world to do because how you go from a love story and you know, just be in this fine line that you are never in, in the judgment, that you just are factual. And you know, I think that the spectator of the film you don't need to chew everything and just ask people to swallow it. You can just actually give a p good piece of steak and ask the people to cut it, chew it, and swallow it by themselves. You, not, you I, don't have I to pre-digest it for them. No, exactly, but I trust the, the, the brain. I, I trust the, 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 the intelligence of the spectator. People, they are much more intelligent than we think that they are. So uh, that was, for me, if people, they can ask themselves the questions, also driven by this beautiful love story, but how to make it is just a result of lots of lots of lots of work. And probably this is the reason why I wanted to make this film, because that was uh, really, frankly, the b most challenging thing I've ever read. Uh, it was very difficult to figure out how to make it work. And, um, you know, in storytelling terms, I mean, this is a romance on one side, and the well, the love interest dies halfway through it, so that was a real challenge for you, Jack, wasn't it? I mean, how to deal with that, how to keep Pierre alive through the rest of the film? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, Rosamond, I'd like to ask you, you've been uh, gracious enough to come to the festival a number of times. Uh, you were here with a private war, you were here with the United Kingdom, and um, I w in both of those other cases, actually also playing women from fairly recent uh, history. Um, what attracted you to working with Marjan on this particular project? And also, is there something about playing kind of r women from real life, I suppose, or from recent history that, that is interesting to you? Is there something about investigating, investigating a life that's been lived? Uh, um, yes. The, the I think, you know, a, a lot of the time with acting, you get to embody qualities that you lack, <laughs> which is one of the great pleasures. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, I mean, on one level, you think it, it's, it's an amazing opportunity to, to, to bring to life someone like Marie Curie and, and enlighten people as to all the amazing things that she did, you know, hope, you know, Hopefully, people will discover her through film who might not discover her through reading a biography. Um, it's also, it is also a challenge uh, because people have very strong opinions and can easily you know, deem that your, your version is not their version of the person. Um, I think that was particularly so of Marie Colvin because her friends were very much around and alive and, uh, and her memory and her loss was so recent. It's a bit different with Madame Curie because, you know, there are living relatives, but it's not like she's in, in sort of vivid living memory for people. Um, and Marjan, uh, I mean, I really felt she was the person who could, had the fierce intelligence to take on a character like Marie Curie and not dial her down. I think we all felt that she was this uncompromising quite prickly person, and that's not always people's taste on, in film. You know, people do sometimes want their heroines more likable, 
and more readily, or readily likable, I should say. I find her very likable, but she's not easy. She's, she's not giving you an easy ride of, of, of liking her. You don't seem to be afraid of playing unlikable characters. I Sorry? think everyone knows I'm you from <laughs> Gone Girl, so uh, no. <laughs> very uh, <laughs> complex no. woman there as well. Yeah, I think, you know, we've got a lot to learn from these women who don't really give a damn about whether they're liked or not. <laughs> um, you know, and I think, um, I do think Marjan had the sort of original mind to take her on, and we, we, you know, we both really defended that version of her. And I think, you know, it comes from Jack's script and Lauren's book, and um, that 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 she was a passionate, fiercely passionate creature, but not a not a simple one. Um, and uh, and I think she had a sense of humor. It just might not be everyone's sense of humor. <laughs> Um, there, there are lovely moments of animation in the film as well, and I, you know, I think anyone who, who had seen Persepolis, uh, one of the films that first brought you to international notice, would have taken real pleasure in that as well. Um, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about maybe blending uh, what first brought you to notice in terms of the animation that you did with Persepolis and, and the live action work here. Well. Uh when I started in animation, I, w you know, I was really, I really didn't want to, to make films at all because, uh, you know, they proposed to me to make the animation of Persepolis and I already made them comic books and normally, you know, it, uh, when you, ma you make a book into a film, it's not always a good idea made by the author, you're sure it's bad. <laughs> and uh, I was like, for four years, I was thinking with one way of telling the story and one narration and why should I do it in another way? And in another, at the same time, you know, a voice in my head was like, they were paying me so I would learn something new. So this is how Persepolis started. But I really didn't like to make animation. I hated it because it's very, very long, extremely long, you know, like it's 12 image per second, all hand drawn, and everybody wanted to draw like me, and everybody, and, and that's, I hated everyone that I, 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 I worked with for a long time. And yet I mean, you continued. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I mean, I, I started really liking them and understanding that they were not actually trying to copy me and steal my soul when it was <laughs> the end of the project. <laughs> but I, I didn't enjoy doing it. Really, it was days when I went to animation studio and they were like, and also, you know, I'm a smoker and I'm really not in a good mood in the morning. And everybody was like, hi, hi, hi. And I was like, eh. And I, <laughs> and I really wanted everybody of them to die, really, that was to this extent. Sounds like a nightmare. And, and then the animation finished. And then I, I, I was like, okay, so, and this, you know, this is like a marathon you have to run, and I'm not a runner of marathon, you know, I'm, I'm good at 100 meter, 200, 400 meter maximum, but you know, more than that, I, 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 I really can't do it. And then I discovered really, uh, you know, like a real action, film, and the thing is that uh, when you have real actors and when they're good, you can actually use and abuse their talent to bring the, 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 the film much further than what you think. I mean, uh, if I want to say to Rosamond or to Anurin, you know, you come and then, you know, you turn your head, you know, to the left and you do this and you do that, then I can make animation and I am in control of everything. The good thing when you take great actors is that they bring something you have not been thinking about and that is nothing more gracious than actually some moment you know they would do something that I'm not expecting and suddenly I instead of being the director I'm the spectator of my own film and this is the best moments you know of directing is when it does not belong to me anymore and when the actor takes it and bring it much further than what I thought so I prefer really live action also because of this interaction that we have like we, when we you know we met with Rosamund her understanding of Madame Curie and my understanding of Madame Curie was very much the same on the top of that and you know, I was really looking for a very intelligent uh, person I mean Rosamund is super intelligent you see this beautiful woman in reality she's a big brain on two legs <laughs> <laughs> all, the rest, all the rest is just yeah. it's true no, because, because, you know, I mean, when you want to play a very intelligent person, you know, intelligence, you can see it in the eyes. And, you know, an intelligent person can always pretend to be stupid, but the other way around it doesn't work. You know, like, <laughs> so, that's, that's why she, she's a star. 
Okay, big brain. <laughs> um, we're almost out of time, but I, I want to end by asking you uh, generally um, what you hope to achieve when this film goes out into the world. There are a lot of young women, girls, who are maybe studying science or choosing not to study science who could be affected by watching a film like this, and, and I'm not sure if you've got grander hopes in terms of how you think this film can affect um, people who, who might be, who might never have seen a genius in the form of a woman scientist. Well, just uh, as I just said at the beginning, if young girls, they can see that and they can think this is extremely attractive to be intelligent and being a scientist is great. If for other people they can ask themselves other questions about science and ethics, even better. If uh, the little boys, they can watch this film and they can say, the girls that are, are in our class, for example, they're just as good as us and because, so for me, Basically, if we touch the young girls, very good, but if we can touch everyone, much better. Osman? No, well put. I mean, well put. That's, that's all we hope, really, is that pe people... I think people will be astonished, really, by what Marie Curie did right, right through her life. And I think, um, you know, we need scientists more than ever, don't we? I mean, that's, the, that's where the really exciting path of life lives. You know, we need new antibiotics and, you know, uh, all kinds of innovation is exciting, but discovery must be the most exciting of all, you know, to actually, you know, to still work. While, while people are doing, obviously, there are realms of science that are flashier, but there are also realms of science that are very necessitous and... Um, I suppose if people can pursue that, then, and inspired by our film, that would be amazing. But then the other flip side of it is, of course, like my friend's daughter, you know, there's a, there's a huge amount of books about coming out about amazing women at the moment, and there's, you've probably everyone's seen the series, you know, there are little books for children on Marie Curie and Rosa Parks, and um, I don't know, lots of, lots of various women, and anyway, my, my my friend's daughter just got one the other day, and she said, oh, no, Mum, not another book about amazing women. <laughs> <laughs> so. yeah, but also, I think if our girls, they can learn, you know, not always to be polite and not always to, you know, be, try to be forgiven, you know, for what they are and not having to please to everyone. And it's okay, you know, if, uh, you know, because they always, treat, they, they told me many times, they were like, oh, a real lady wouldn't do it. A real lady wouldn't do it. You know, but by this, you know, real lady shit, you know, there are lots of things that you cannot do. So fuck the lady, I do what I want. <laughs> so, so. Again, well put. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we are going to have to end it there, unfortunately. So I'll just ask you to please join me in thanking this remarkable team of filmmakers, <laughs> producer Paul Webster, screenwriter Jack Thorne, actor Aneran Barnard, the star of the film Rosamund Pike, and director Marjan Satrapi.